Good evening, everyone. So I'd like to um, welcome you to this evening's events on how to modernise and optimise our decarbonised energy system through digitalisation. Now, this is a Energy Futures Lab um, evening lecture, part of a series that we host. So we're very pleased that you can join us for this one. Um, my name is Dr. Hayden Rhodes. I'm the Energy Policy Briefing Papers Fellow at Research Fellow at the Energy Futures Lab. And I work on preparing based on the briefing papers, which is a range of papers designed to be to present complex energy topics in accessible ways with recommendations for policy makers and other stakeholders. And I'd like to introduce our, our speaker tonight, Laura Sands. Um, she has um, chaired an awful lot of things, the government's energy data and digitalization task forces for energy. Um, she's chaired the British Standards Institute Advisory Board of Net Zero. Um, she's an independent director at SSE and on the board of the Energy Systems Catapult, Own Global and High View Power. I've work, worked with Law before. We produced a report just before the pandemic, which uh, on, on regulation and new, on the new digitalization energy system. And so I can personally say, I'm really looking forward to seeing what she has to say on this matter. Um, in a moment, I'll hand over to her. Um, we will then move to a Q&A session after the presentation. If you're watching online, um, please submit any questions uh, via the Q&A box. And if you are online um, and you see a question that you like, please like it so we know which are the most popular questions to ask from our online audience. If you're in the room, just stick your hand up. We will have a roving microphone uh, to just raise a hand. Um, and finally, this event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So if anyone couldn't make it, please share the recording with them um, so they can watch it as well. So it now gives me a great pleasure to hand over to Laura Sands. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aidan, and it's been wonderful working with you in the past. And the Energy Futures Lab is really one of the great organisations that's really informing what we need to do into the future. And you have great expertise when it comes to digitalisation. Um, I mean, digitalisation, when we're looking at the renewable um, energy system, is going to have to be an absolute core, core part of that transformation. But in a weird way, and I'll go on to this a little bit more detail, it's more than just the engineering world of energy, the, the, the sort of long standing um, people within the energy sector. They're going to have to learn different skills, different ways of managing the system and very different approaches. And I think that's where the fundamental challenge comes as we digitalise. So, um, this, because I used to be a politician, I am a recovering politician. Um, this is the politician sitting in the middle here, looking at the past and looking at the future. And that future, that past was big as beautiful, um, designed and built by engineers, bastardized by economists and marketeers. The power sector continues to confuse customers. Um, blind man's bluff. We have system operators around the world, but actually, they couldn't see the assets that were on that system. And it's become more and more obvious that actually there is very little visibility of the system as it is changing. But look at this future. I have to have something with Monty Python on it, so blessed are the cheesemakers. But actually what we're talking about here is a much more distributed system. We're talking about a lot of capital assets. We'll come on to that in more detail. We're talking about data and insights in a totally different way from how we have in the past. And we're also talking about locations and locational differences and the dynamics of them. So this is, and if you are a policymaker and you're sitting in the middle, you are dragged back by the past and driven on by the future. And at this moment, um, I wish we were further on the future, but um, we've still got quite a lot of legacy thinking. But what this means, the new system, is not just a transformation um, from, in many ways, a, a digital transformation. It is actually a whole cost based transformation. So we're moving from a capital from a commodity based system to a capital asset system. So on the on on the left, we have got all these assets that we're going to need on the system and they might be in your driveway, on your roof, in the North Sea um, or they might be grids 
our transmission and distribution. And to be frank, when we start to look at the future, the commodity itself is going to become less and less valuable, in my view. So if you think in 1990, a terabyte of data was a million dollars, and today it is five cents. I'm not saying the electron is going to go that way, but actually it is going to be location and time and capacity that's going to be as important in the value. On the right hand side, we have customers. Now they need these assets, but as we know, cost of living, um, general capital outlay. So our, what are we going to be delivering these customers? We're going to be delivering them financial service products. Um, there is a great project going on in Spain where actually energy is free. What happens is that the distribution network and everybody, everybody, the people who have PV, a lot of them, actually they don't pay for the electricity at all. What they're paying for is for a localised storage capacity. So actually they're paying exactly like iCloud. So cloud storage is coming into the energy sector. But all of these elements, the value that we have never picked up in the energy sector in its linear engineering world, actually sits in the middle. And this is where optimization, um, <clears throat> temporal value, flexibility, um, and location and software is going to optimize this system. And it, it's many, in, in many ways, it's the same journey. And that's why I really like to make the point is actually this journey isn't a new journey. It's a journey other sectors have gone through. It's just the engine, the, the energy sector um, is quite staggered by this particular challenge that they're having to deal with. But the energy system operator is saying we are going to need 20 to 30 gigawatts of flexibility by 2035. That is massive. And all of that flexibility will come from these assets plus the um, digitalization of the energy system. So is this uh, our new Secretary of State in the middle? Or is this Ofgem? Or is it you if you run a utility? All these different vectors are all going to come together. So you've got this conflation of assets. They've all got different characteristics. They've got different personalities and they will react in the system in a different way. But um, I say this and my friends in the energy sector, I hope don't throw too many tomatoes. But currently at this moment, we have probably 400 people who run the energy sector and they all know each other's gold kind of cap. Isn't that fantastic? We are moving to 100 million actions and assets on the system. If you think every EV car can do three things, if you think the amount of distributed um, generation we're going to have, storage, and in many ways, some of the value of those assets is not them on their own. It's going to be the blend. So I always talk about somebody who makes electrons as being like a milk farmer. We need a lot more cheese makers. We need um, generation in many ways, jointly investing in storage and creating, um, in some ways, complete products rather than each of these technologies living on their own in their silos. Because the value is not in the individual technology. The value is in the proposition that comes from those technologies. And I think the energy, energy sector has, again, looked very much technology first rather than outcome solution first. The reason why I'm explaining, sort of going back on this, is there is a big question about why digitalization, and a lot of people in the energy sector do are, are, are still needing to be convinced. But the significant system changes, weather does not take price signals. It's fascinating the amount of investment that we put into understanding the weather. When actually demand, do you know how boring we all are? How many of you in this room change your alarm clock every morning? Right, well, actually, you're very, I mean, this is the most boring group of people because none of you change your alarm clock in the morning. You and I are so dull in comparison to the weather. And we're also biddable too. So if you start to think about where you're going to get this flexibility from, Actually, the weather is the variable and we 
are much, much more predictable. The problem about the energy sector fundamentally is, again, and as I said, I'm very much involved in it, is it doesn't really like customers because customers are these, they're, they're not engineering um, challenges. Um, we're seen as being, in many ways, erratic, um, unpredictable, etc. But actually, when you start to look at the insights that we can get through digitalization of what our patterns are, how we can be, how, how biddable we are to, to shift and change, we can play a massive role in the system. And so in our propositions that, that I've been working on with the wonderful energy systems catapult, as well as um, many people here, is that demand must be considered equal to supply not in scale, but in value. And that's a very different way of thinking of the system. So there are three drivers of change in my view, and digitalization sits right at the heart of all of these, but in some ways it is about the dynamic changes that actually will inform us where and how digitalization um, will play its role. So we talk about demand and supply being equal, all the great physicists in this room know that the physics tells us demand and supply are equal, markets tell us demand and supply are equal, the energy sector has not really recognised that um, over the past 30 years. Flexibility is going to be absolutely crucial um, to our system design unless we want to absolutely over, um, over build and the customer is part of that. In new business models, um, optimization, as I said, blending, blending propositions is going to be really important. And the thing I will focus on is digital transformation. And very important that actually comes out of those two quite new drivers for the energy sector is new skills and people. So I was quite amused when we started the energy data task force. Um, and we talk about digitalization and all that. You got the chief executives of all the great companies together, and we said, right, okay, so tell us what are the skills that you've got in your organization? And one turkey chatty put his hand up and said, Oh, we've got this fantastic person. They, they did a brilliant job rolling out Microsoft Word. And so I started to realize that I was really talking about people who understood a little bit, only a little bit about IT, not about data and digitalization, and that there was a massive education job to do. And as we were talking earlier actually about this, is when an engineer meets a digital native, they are talking totally different languages. And that is going to be a really interesting challenge as we go forward. So I start with customers because actually customers and um, demand side action is going to be really, really crucial. But that is where the proliferation of activity is going to happen. And we've been doing some work with the Bayes modeling team, which shows that every time you put a demand side asset onto the system, you lower whole system costs. So not only do you get the flexibility from a lot of those demand side assets, but also you're lowering whole system costs. So we've got to start planning on both sides. But again, the culture of the sector has been very much, if we've got a problem with you know, um, energy balancing, we can ring up Johnny and say ramp up. If we're talking about 100 million actions and assets, this whole system will not work under that. Uh, regime. So we need to design our system around customers. Now, I think, as I said, I don't think energy is um, going through unique transformation in terms of digitalization or distribution or distributed assets. It's actually something that's happened in other sectors many times. Just consider some of us who are old enough to know what something called a mainframe was. This was a very clunky centralized system of delivery of, um, of data. And with the emergence of PCs and mobile phones, the whole system has been upended and it is now designed around my utilization and reflects that. Now, it's not to say there isn't a lot of centralized data centers and system design, but it is designed around me 
and my patterns, my flexibility and the insights the companies have about how I use data rather than me having to squeeze myself into the system itself, which is currently a little bit where we are in the energy sector. Food. <clears throat> Food is also an interesting area. When I was little, there was something called the Milk Marketing Board and then the Beef Marketing Board and then the uh -uh Marketing Board. These people set prices. And if you went to the shops, you'd go to a, a small little corner shop and you as a customer were a price taker and a choice taker. You would not, there, there was very, very little um, consumer, in many ways, pressure in the system. Um, not saying that supermarkets haven't got lots of problems, but they have revolutionized this. And when you start to look at what a supermarket actually understands about us and understands about its supply chain, these are the models that we have to look at when we look forward to the energy system. So there is always this great thing that Tesco says that they can tell um, that a woman is pregnant before she knows it herself because of her purchasing patterns. Um, they absolutely know exactly what sorts of, of menus, of what sort of food that we want through lots of different algorithms. And they have divided, so the energy sector divides us into six archetypes, 60 million people in six archetypes. Um, Tesco divides us into 35,000 different archetypes. So the texture of understanding, and they've been doing this for 30 years. And the energy sector still doesn't have that understanding enough of customers. I have a fridge there because a fridge is a very interesting flexibility asset. Because if you didn't have fridges in your home, supermarkets would have to be four times the size they are today. So actually, consumers, whether it be through an EV car, whether it be a small business with some form of battery storage, are all optimizing the system. But the interactions between all these different system designs are things that certainly the food, certainly the data section understand. We are still at the very beginning of this understanding um, that other sectors have, have gone through. So, as I said, assets are going to be important and these assets, these tens of millions of assets are going to be delivering us flexibility, Actually, security, resilience, people think, oh my God, we're going to have all these assets on the system. This is going to be a problem for us. Actually, fundamentally, the more assets that we have on the system, the more distributed they are and certainly connected in a digital way, they actually will deliver us more resilience rather than less resilience. We will possibly end up with um, certainly, probably in, in numbers, more system failures, but they will be incredibly localised. Today, in a weird way, we are actually very vulnerable to very to much less often, but very large um, system stability issues. And that complexity of these multiple assets is going to be really, really important to manage. So that was the customer and how the customer is going to proliferate. This is about the digital programs that I've been involved in. So if you think about these 100 million actions and assets, we're going to have multiple and changing customer preferences. And we're going to have to respond to that. We can't turn people's um, you know, heating off if they don't want it. And it's going to have to be very designed around customers, not around the system. There's going to be the interaction between these parties. Um, new business models will emerge through those interactions and uh, actions and blended propositions. You're also going to have a quite significant amount of, um, significant, thousands and thousands of algorithms. Now, if I was sitting running the energy system, trying to keep the lights on, I've got to have some visibility of those algorithms because it might not be my, that might not be your algorithm, but your algorithm might cascade into another algorithm and create system problems. So we are going to need quite a lot of governance around this. But the idea that digitalization is a sort of nice to have, or it's a layering on the top of the processes that we currently do today, 
um, is would be most unfounded. I mean, would be quite seriously um, badly understanding the level and complexity and new and quantity of actions and assets on the system. So it is absolutely essential to that digitalization will be absolutely essential to this future system design and for its resilience. So the data and digitalization task force task forces really were there to deliver four key elements. One was data visibility, which the energy sector again is, is starting this journey and they're starting this journey quite slowly, but I think so through regulation, we're moving faster than possibly we might have expected in the past. What this data visibility does is it tell us where assets are. So asset visibility is going to be very important and infrastructure visibility. Um, I don't know whether people remember in 2019, we ended up with, I think it was a four minute um, system collapse and it wasn't actually, the, the system recovered pretty quickly, but that was absolutely because the energy system operator could not see some of these assets. Um, on the system. So we've got to have much greater system visibility, asset visibility. The digitalization task force looked at operational optimization, taking that data and operationalizing it. And that would include obviously all the issues around AI, algorithms, etc. And then from that, we get to an open system design. Um, we one of our recommendations was that um, energy energy data should be presumed open. That doesn't mean to say if it's purity risk or whether it would be open, but it's presumed open to try and ensure that we have a system by which people can interact um, and benefit, and that there is visibility for the energy system operator and also for the regulator. So our approach to the task force was one of trying to create exciting tailored customer propositions, a stable and resilient system, accelerating decarbonisation and whole system optimization. And that was um, how we framed our report that went to government. And what we were looking at from what we've discussed about the overall new system and how it looks, we had two use cases. I hate use cases, by the way, because it, use cases are all designed around something I can I, I know today. Actually, this is a journey we're going on where we shouldn't confine ourselves to what we believe is the case today. But we tried to make these as broad as possible. The first one was prices to devices, and that is an EV car communicating with an offshore wind operator. That, of course, they won't. But actually, if supply and demand are equal, we're going to have to need to have a system by which those data flows can move through the system in an interoperable way. Also, a very important part of this, which is a new component, and um, that is carbon. And we're going to need particular um, border adjustments, et cetera. We're going to need carbon um, data flowing through the system. So that's prices to devices. When you're looking at the system operations, then we're talking, looking at, um, in many ways, the, the scale up. So I would look at this a little bit and say, how does data flow up and down the system to ensure that, let's say, the energy system operator, that you could call the A&E department of the energy sector, how they can have visibility of how risk is, is rising or lowering so that there is in many ways the data flow coming from a device right the way through the system. And this sounds all very complicated in an energy sense, but actually these are two use cases that if you look at other sectors, they've been through um, before and are actually much, much more complicated. So our job was getting the plumbing right. What we were concerned about and what is starting to happen is actually a lot of digitalization is happening in the energy sector, but it's all peer-to-peer, -peer. it's all one-to-one. -one. 
And what we're getting is a, not a system, but a Tower of Babel where we're ending up with lots of interactions or lack of interactions that are actually creating more vulnerability. So our job was really to get the plumbing right. And um, I do tell my husband I have become a plumber, but I hope he doesn't uh, show me the boiler any day to try and address it. So these were our top line recommendations. We got to unlock this value of, of consumers, of their actions and their assets. And so we were proposing a customer consent dashboard mandating smart energy assets. And there's a third one there, which is auto asset registration. All of these recommendations have been um, accepted by government and they're in different phases of development. The second is deliver interoperability and we call this the digital spine. You might want to call it the HTML of energy and I will come on to that in, um, in, in more detail. But fundamentally what that is, it is looking at is our prices to devices um, type infrastructure. And what is very exciting is that there is quite a lot of conversation about this digital spine becoming a global asset, a public interest global asset that could um, offer a huge amount of optimization internationally. New digital governance, that is important and that is the thing that maybe is the least developed and then enable carbon monitoring and accounting. So the customer actions, if we do not build trust in the energy sector and to be frank, trust is not at the sort of the highest point in the energy sector, um, we are going to lose these flexibility assets. So the energy system operators said that by 2035, the number of EVs on the system will equate to two nuclear power stations. That is the capacity that we will have in terms of customer assets. So consent is really important. And so we're building at this moment as sort of a shape around a customer consent um, dashboard, which will ensure that customers feel they're in control. And that's going to be crucial as we go forward. Um, the second key point that I wanted to highlight was the digital spine. And this is not a data lake. This is absolutely a noble um, data sharing fabric um, with an interface and standardization. And it will ingest data um, and in many ways cover right from you know, the generation through to the demand and the systems that are needed or, and access by those that need that data to optimise the system throughout. Um, as I say, this is very much looking at potentially a global digital asset. Um, it will enable core functions, but what it must be, because this we believe has to be a, a national asset or a global asset, but not a commercial asset. It has to be absolutely as thin as possible to allow exciting new propositions to sit on top of it. So, as I say, my analogy for this is HTML of energy, which is probably the um, thinnest layer that you can create interoperability um, on. And that, and I know that people here from Arab, Arab and the energy systems capital to absolutely instrumental in this work are pulling together some very interesting work on behalf of government to take these um, products and um, opportunities forward. So the decarbonisation digital journey, we believe has sort of six key elements to it. We've talked about customer control, automated asset registration, the digital spine being absolutely crucial and the sort of the, the most important element here. Networks sharing data, a flexibility exchange, providing the system operator with visibility. So these are the, the six key assets that we believe are absolutely crucial. There will need to be governance over this. We will need to have quite significant 
um, cybersecurity uh, protocols. They will also have to be, um, as I say, governance. And currently, and I don't think any government can say that they're yet matured to this stage, is I believe that we will need some form of data and digital infrastructure uh, regulator, because I think there will need to be some form of governance body that looks at the cascading of these algorithms, ensures some form of transparency and visibility, um, because this is critical national infrastructure. But it will not be done in an analogue way. So we have to lean into the challenges and ensure that um, we put the right systems in place. So these were conclusions that the Energy Systems Catapult, myself and, and many other partners um, pulled together for, for government. And we feel that there are many com countries that are moving very fast on one or two of these. Um, but as a coherent uh, shape of all these different digital assets, uh, the UK really is probably leading at this moment. We don't want to lose momentum. But fundamentally, this comes to a massive change in people and culture. As I said, um, you know, we've got a lot of other systems that have gone through this transformation from a centralized system to a distributed system where customers matter. Um, I'm always intrigued by both the food sector and the logistics sector. So one day it would be great that an energy company is run by a former CEO of DHF. If you think of this, I buy trainers online, for example, they're coming from, from Malaysia. Um, they are going to have to go through five or six different transport factors. People are involved. My God, that's a variable. The energy sector doesn't have people involved. It just goes down a, a wire or a pipe. So actually, you know, there's many less variables um, in, in the energy sector. Um, let's say that the transport goes down in, in Kuala Lumpur. They can't get out of the port. DHL automatically will be finding new routings for this. And it will be dealing with me because I'm also the customer. To think that a logistics firm actually cares about customers, it's it's a transformation. I can get online any moment I want, and I want to, and I can see exactly where those shoes are. So this is whole system design, it's logistics. The chief executive of Tesco can tell you, if he wanted to, where a semi-skinned half pint of milk is in his supply chain. He can say that it's on a Eddie Stobart truck caught up in a traffic jam in the M1. And he's dealing with 40,000 different products. The energy sector at this moment is only dealing with two different products. So the system design exists in other sectors. It's just we haven't embraced it yet. And we're on a journey of modernization, a journey of learning from other sectors. We need to get out a lot more. Um, and we can learn from those people who understand logistics, variable system design, and also consumer insights. So it's an exciting time, but the culture issue is really quite significant. And I think that is where um, people like myself and many people in this room really need to work hard on. Um, the technology is there in other sectors. It's the people that we need to change the system. So there will be losers and winners in the new system. If you're a milk farmer, you've got to become a cheesemaker. If what you're doing is selling kilowatt hours, you've got to move into system of op uh, op energy optimization. If you're treating your customer as if they were just a meter number, currently, um, you're going to lose them. You need to co-create with them. And I hope very much that we're going to turn a lot more data into products and services that both decarbonize our system as quickly as possible, keep our system safe and resilient, and delight our customers. Thank you very much. So, uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so for questions, and then we have a group to set up from the other side. So, um, I think we'll take questions in groups of three, as long as we have questions, that's the right view, isn't it? 
right here. So, uh, yeah, please raise your hand and I'd like to come around. All right, we'll start at the front. So, the gentleman in the, um, in the shirt there, in the jacket there, the gentleman over there, and then the gentleman in the green shirt over there. Well, I think you worry me quite a bit for what you said. Um, I'm, I've always thought that maybe it's a change of mind, or um, a change of thinking required. I've always thought of certain things as natural monopolies and things like power obviously comes into that or has come into that uh, area. I'm a little bit scared from what you're saying about what maybe I call the robber barons, where you've got, you, you talked about these large companies and how wonderful they are at coping with this, but no, they, they have a stranglehold on us, the customers. We don't actually have choice. They tell us Amazon is a, a most oppressive organization, makes huge profits for the boss, and like me, just the boss, not anybody else there. And I cannot see the way you describe things, how this is going to be any different from that big um, private monopolies. Um, and you talk about a regulator, boy, that would have to be a powerful regulator, and I can't see how that's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Laura. So, commenting from a slightly different perspective, because I um, very, very strongly think this is the future, natural future of the energy system, particularly decarbonised energy system. But my my head's into sort of where's the where's the entry point to try and make this happen? Because I think there's a lot of consensus now that this is the description of what we need to happen. But it's like, how do we get into it? I just wondered what you thought about the way in the last year there's been such a massive investment in many different places around the world in the grid and the, and the need to make that that huge scale investment in the grid compatible with and indeed catalyzing the kind of approach you're describing and whether you feel that's happening or whether you feel we might be missing the opportunity at the moment to, to combine the updating and modernization of the grid you know with the principles and the vision that we've been laying out. Brilliant. I am a great sort of lawyer. I'm going to start off in this late, so maybe we can get to others, but I do have um, three questions uh, with regards to the curtailment of quality and access to data and the appetite for blockchain industry. In terms of the curtailment issue, whilst you can have distributed energy assets, it's only applicable up to a certain point, mm -hmm. because once it, it goes beyond that, uh, you produce too much. With the system to handle, and we will be seeing this in California, where this is uh, paradoxically increasing electricity prices. And my second question is in relation to quality and access to data. Uh, the data from smart meters can't always be relied upon, and you need and the smart meters actually owned by an energy company, and you can't just like buy off the API requests that them. You need that submission. So how are you going to incorporate that into distribution model to account for it? And lastly, uh, which is my area of expertise, uh, what's the appetite for blockchain in the industry? Okay. There you go. So I guess we'll come back this way. Um, I mean, blockchain is, is sort of fine, but I'm, if, if that's the right application but it is an application it isn't an end point in in my view um but you can persuade me over a drink that it that it is on the quality of data it was quite interesting because we could have said on one of our uh, uh data task forces that um everybody needed to get all their data up to a really really good standard right if we'd done that we would see no data for about 30 years because it would take ages for them to clean all the data up and the data is and, and i think everyone would acknowledge this i think the technical term is pretty crap right i think that's the um the assessment so the data isn't a great quantity but we felt the most important thing is that the data was open and then those people that found that there was value in that, they would then start to clean it up. 
because otherwise we, we, we would end up cleaning up all data and some of it would be totally uninteresting and some of it would be extremely valuable and might not come online. So, so there is a real, real issue there. And I've totally forgotten the third thing, but maybe we can do that over drinks. Um, lovely to see you. And when we start to look at um, infrastructure and how infrastructure is being designed, I, I mean, I have to say that our regulator has totally starts to lean in on digitalization, and I'm extremely impressed by their capabilities. Whether it's actually understood as it's an integral part of changing how you invest in grids, and maybe even what sort of grids you might want, yes. and that conflation, I think we're still at the first stage of Yes, this is important. They put in quite a lot of money behind it through um, the price control. Um, I hope very much that the next round of price controls is going to have a much more integrated digital solution, potentially digital first and infrastructure second, but completed. There is a really, really big issue about infrastructure. And that is digitalization. And I come on to your anxiety because you're absolutely not taking very, very important points. Um, digitalization is only as good as the communications infrastructure. We have the, the expert here, Eric Brown, on the conflation of energy and communications. So I have a good, good friend of mine who's involved in an EV charging operation and they all, everybody plugs in all their cars, they all plug in at six o'clock in the evening, but they only get charged at three o'clock in the morning, right? So suddenly he gets, he sees everybody who's plugged in, they're all charging at six o'clock in the morning, in the evening. But this can't be happening, and talks his tech team, talks to the energy company. What had happened was that 4G went down in that particular area, right? So comms networks, need to be integrated and we've been having a lot of talks with Ofgem, the energy regulator and Ofcom to try and understand these things together. Very, very important points. Now, number one is you're absolutely right. We have no choice in the energy sector today. All we have is different coloured logos, right? The price is the same, everything is the same and you could just as well nationalise it and nobody would notice any difference. I'm actually not really talking about ownership because that's, I mean, it's interesting, but in some ways, the, I, I'm not talking about Amazon owning it, but I'm talking about the technology, the understanding of system design that Amazon can help the system with. My other part of my life is I do a lot of work in food systems. And all I can say, you know, I talk, talk shiningly about supermarkets. I have real problems, right? I think so. But what they have in terms of digital infrastructures is really, really important and interesting. And we would have to repurpose it for, for the energy sector. And it is a critical national infrastructure piece. So it does matter, ownership matters. The energy system operator is now being nationalized. So that is coming into um, the state's control. And so that, uh, they would be in many ways, the sort of mothership these digital assets and so it would be in public ownership. What you then do customers, I think it would be currently, we almost, I mean what we have is we have privatised companies that are being regulated to behave as if they were nationalised companies. <laughs> Actually what we need is we need some very very important basic essential service that everyone gets and then allow a lot more competition in you've got an EV and a PV and a battery and this and all the rest of it, you're an unusual person, so you can have your own package. But fundamentally, um, we've got to ensure, certainly in this new world of digitalization, that governance, um, that regulation, and that visibility, probably the most important, is very, very much enforced. Okay, thank you. Okay, three more questions. So we're going right at the back. Right there. Okay. And then we will go yeah, the, the middle back, uh, and then there, and then the middle one here. Hi, 
Um, I have a question regarding, I think it's quite important to have infrastructures and able the data sharing. But on the other hand, as a consumer, for example, I have one ask question with why I want to share the data. So what would be the view from task force regarding incentives to get sharing their values? But I'm the owner, why I share that? Example I want to give is, I mean, smart meter, for example, no matter you share five, uh, half hourly or daily, you get a same target. Right, why am I sharing? So what's the view on that? Hello. Uh, thanks. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is around, um, I think similar to the, the last gentleman over there, around um, dealing with the privacy of uh, people's personal data in the, the sense of that smart metering um, granular consumption data. Um, how um, under this uh, framework and plan um, do you intend to kind of unlock that, the value of that granular data whilst maintaining people's um, you know, data privacy? And uh, the second question is um, how much of the uh, flexibility in the grid, do you think, can be unlocked through digitalization versus conventional reinforcement? And at what point do we need to actually just reinforce the grid? Um, just down here, right? Um, All your aspirations and hopes come down to politics. Yeah. Legislation is the key. Do you have support from both Labour and Tory, the only two parties that can inform the next UK government? OK, so I'll start with politics and I'll come back around. Um, the politics are that, I mean, the government, the current government accepted all our recommendations. So, um, Actually, now this is all about deployment. How a, a, a lot of this is about how you do it, not whether you do it. So I don't think and I don't think that we need any legislation. I, I know we don't. Um, what we need is people who are far too close to the energy sector will know the four-letter word called code. The codes in the energy sector are absolutely frightful sort of Byzantine system design. So some things need to be unpicked. It doesn't need legislation. I, as I say, I call myself a plumber because it makes everything that I'm doing sound really boring, that no politician could be at all interested in it. And it feels like that's the best place to do exciting things from. Um, and so I don't feel that, and I, I work with, all parties and I don't feel that there is any resistance to it. It is much more about how do we do it? Um, is it properly the proper governance around it? Um, and in some ways, the belief that it can happen. Right, the gentleman at the back, um, grid reinforcement or demand side response, right? So I'm going to come back to the food sector that. Um, and what, if we if we do not optimize the system, we will end up with so much energy generation, a lot of it being constrained, i.e. wasted, a lot of it having to be stored, transported, etc. Demand side response is absolutely crucial to lower the whole system costs, as I showed on those metrics. So it's absolutely crucial. The food sector is quite interesting because before we had refrigeration, we lost probably about I don't know, 40 to 60 percent of food. Right. What's refrigeration? So what you've got is um, frozen food is long duration storage. Right. Grid scale batteries is refrigerated warehousing. Now, on the domestic side, EV cars, that's flash freezing. That's very quick, it's, it's very immediate responsiveness. And as I say, the fridge in your home is the most important storage vector for the whole of the food sector. 
because it reduces supermarket um, supermarket sizes and the whole supply chain. So if what you do is you don't unlock that consumer element of it, you will just have, have to have a very much larger hose pipe shooting down tons and tons and tons of energy, majority of which will get wasted. A lot of infrastructure will have to be built. And in many ways, no other system would be that wasteful. So I think that there is, it, 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 it's not beyond, it's not, beyond the, um, us to do this, to design this, and the new future system operator will be will be doing that. Um, but I think that we've got to unlock that consumer side. Now then both of you talk about something absolutely crucial, and that is um, both the desire and the trust that I can, I would give my data to somebody. Actually, we've got another expert here, Judith Ward, uh, who's done a huge amount of work around unlocking the um, smart meter data. So firstly, and correct me if I'm wrong, firstly, on the whole, one's looking to unlock smart meter data in an anonymized form, so an aggregated form, so it is not your data. But I think absolutely crucially that this plus consumer consent <laughs> is absolutely crucial at this particular stage. We're trying to unlock a new asset. We're trying to build confidence around how you can participate in the energy sector. And if we don't do that in an absolutely customer anxiety way, I with that anxiety understanding, um, we won't get there. However, what I would hope we have, I can dream, what I would hope we have is very exciting proposition from companies saying if you share this data we can reduce the cost of your EV car by a significant amount. Now actually you're going to get more value from that data than you're getting from Google today because that's scraping it all away. I mean they give you a free search service but in many ways at least the contractual relationship will be um, something that will, will reward you. However, the most important thing is, if you don't want to share your data, if you don't want to participate, you will absolutely must have all rights to keep way out of this sector or way out of these opportunities. Brilliant. Um, I think we are just about out of time, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. just one more question, one more question. Okay. Two more questions. Two more questions. <laughs> Thank you. That's fascinating. And I've got a consumer focused question, which is totally agree with the whole digitalization, getting that digital spine and flexibility for the future system operator. How do we create and how do we use flexibility to further the decarbonization and uptake of renewables? First, because that business case isn't still quite stacking up. And how do we then bring in potentially energy price structures that are being addressed at this moment in time with whether that be et cetera, but also carbon pricing? What is your view on that to enable the whole transition? Last question, I'm going right at the back. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a, an entrepreneurial question to relate it to the thing that you actually talked about. I'm actually building a new company right now, which hopefully will help you solve some of the plumbing. It's not, it's not an easy job. Um, I just finished uh, reading this book called uh, uh, Solar Trillions by Tony Seba, and he talked about uh, an example of iTunes revolution in the music industry where they digitized the whole experience and made it so much more easier for consumers to be able to access it. And then he talked about that smart grid in the future should have um, an energy participation for all of the people who have the solar. So be able to produce energy, store it and sell it in such a way where data sharing is secure, but everyone is also benefiting. If I'm looking as an entrepreneur for the market opportunity in the UK, outside the UK, emerging countries, how do I start? Where do I pick? Because I don't, I don't know how to affect the policies as you can, 
but me as an entrepreneur, how do I how do I start making a difference within this industry? Because I think there's huge opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you, and really, really good luck. That's really exciting. Um, and I don't have any influence at all, but I did set up my first company when I was 19, so I understand about taking risks. Um, I, I think that certainly anything to do with distributed assets, scaling the delivery and deployment of distributed assets um, is going to be really needed, but you would need quite a lot of capital, you need quite a lot of infrastructure to make that happen. Um, when you start to look at planning, digitalization, algorithms, etc., cetera, um, are going to be extremely important, but you're still also a little bit waiting for what this gentleman was saying is um, crap data through the system. But I think that there is a huge amount to be done, both on the digital and the renewable side. So really, really good luck. Um, on the consumer side, um, can I, I've come to the carbon thing first. I don't know what the carbon price should be, but it should be a lot more than it is. And when you look at border adjustments, that's why we need, well, firstly, we've got massive drive now for carbon transparency. So um, TCFD, which I always forget it's what it's actually standing for, but the transparency of climate change declarations that all large companies have to do. They have to find out everyone in their supply chain. So, People are going to have to, small businesses, medium sized businesses are going to have to account for their carbon in a totally different way. And that is coming in now. So where are you going to get that data? And actually today, the data is estimated. You know, I said, oh, this is my accounting, my carbon accounting. It's not at all. A lot of it is very, very safe. Um, when it comes to customers and price accounts and all the rest of it, um, that is that is another story altogether. You don't want 40 minutes on how we can reform the retail sector. The retail sector is pretty rubbish. Um, people don't really like their energy companies. There are some really exciting ones, but they're still being regulated in a way, picking up on what this gentleman said, they're being regulated in a way that they just all they can do is sell you a kilowatt hour. And since we don't have any more of those electric bars, I don't even know what a kilowatt hour is anymore. So I used to understand it by that. So um, we we need a very, very big consumer centric um, unlocking the opportunities, the flexibility, but also protecting the vulnerable. I co-chaired a commission uh, with Caroline Lucas and Ed Miliband uh, about two years ago, which was all about the just transition and everything was focused on the most funny. But I will give a plug to, to a company that I'm involved in and they have got the contract for installing EV chargers for Motability. And Motability is the largest fleet in the UK serving those people with disabilities. So this new revolution can come and can be delivered to ed people in all sorts of ways. And what we've got to do is design around people, whatever characteristics they have, rather than expect them to design themselves around the energy sector. Far too often the sector expects or wants us all to become heating engineers. Somehow I'm not interested. Thank you. That was that was really interesting and excellent. Um, there are drinks outside, um, and if you want to ask a little more questions, I think she's hanging around for a bit. Is that correct? So there's drinks outside. Please help yourselves. Thank you.